very welcome to this sort of town hall grassroots sort of debate organized by the Student Union and ECD uh, Philosophical Society. Um, basically, I'm just going to introduce you to our speakers we have tonight and also the format to give you an idea of how it's going to shape up. Um, first of all, we'll have our president of the Student Union, Ryan Bartlett, uh, to give us sort of a brief context of why this debate is important and sort of the, his the history behind it. Um, at that point, we're going to do a preliminary vote. So we'll ask each of you uh, on the motion that TCD Student Union should leave uh, the Union of Students Ireland to say yes, no, or don't know. And what we're going to do is compare that to the end where we call another debate, uh, another sort of vote, and see if anything has changed. Um, after that point, we'll invite uh, Mr. Dave Byrne to the floor. Dave Byrne is a debates convener with the Philosophical Society and a student in junior software law. He'll have 10 minutes to outline his case of why we should leave. Uh, that'll be followed by Gary Redmond, who is a student in UCD, instant disadvantage, Gary, uh, but also, <laughs> uh, more pertinently, he's the president of the Union of Students Ireland. After which point, after the two speeches, there'll be five minutes of rebuttal each where the speakers can uh, have the opportunity to respond directly to what's being said. So that's sort of a 30 minute period. Uh, we'll then invite it to the floor where you guys can, if you feel the debate missed things, can throw it out there. We're also asked like, direct questions to our candidates. Uh, after that point, it sort of swelled down. We can call our final uh, vote and see what's changed. Okay, so without further ado, I'd just like to welcome uh, Ryan Bartlett to tell us about this motion. Uh, hello everyone. Didn't really know I was doing this until so shortly, but uh, to give you an idea, I guess the, the motion to be discussed tonight is that this house would disaffiliate from you, would have Trinity disaffiliate from USI. Um, it's kind of a nice symmetry to be in here tonight because it was 10 years ago that Trinity returned to USI after a 10 year absence. Uh, so I guess it's about time that we start talking about it again. Um, it, uh, it, it basically, this is kind of arose from I had a lot of questions, a lot of students coming to me with questions about how USI works and how things are working and didn't have the answers to give to them. Uh, and, and so th I guess from that, the debate has kind of mushroomed a little bit. And hopefully today uh, we'll be able to talk about some of the arguments and be able to inform uh, all of you guys in the room and also the other people who might watch it later on the video about the arguments for and against uh, being, uh, having Trinity be involved in USI. Um, so really, this is important because all of you pay towards funding USI and its activities, uh, and it should be done, it's being done in your name, and it should be done with your consent. So this is to help you to decide whether or not you think it is a good idea, and then for the student union to get the feedback from the students as to what it should be saying on your behalf. So hopefully you'll uh, listen, engage with the arguments tonight, and come to your own conclusions afterwards. Thanks, Liz. Okay, for those that are versed with sort of this debate, uh, you'll know which way you, you stand and you're free to vote yes or no. If you're not sure, just vote don't know as not to like warp the sort of uh, result. So on the motion that Trinity Student Union should lead USI, um, please like raise your hand if you would think they should. And Brendan is quickly going to top that up uh, along the rows here. should stay within USI. Okay, <laughs> Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that changes by the end of the debate. Okay, so without further ado, 
to remind you, speakers have 10 minutes. They'll hear a bell at the ninth minute to remind them to wrap up, and then a double bell at 10. So don't be alarmed if you hear that ringing sound. Without further ado, we welcome Dave Byrne to the floor. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before I start, I just want to say that um, I'm not just speaking to you as a Phil Wanker, uh, <laughs> but as a student who has no money, as someone who works to keep themselves in college, and as someone who's pretty disgusted by the absolute failure that is the Union of Students Ireland. And whether you want to look at that money as 77,000 euro per year collectively, uh, that could be spent on having some reasonable library opening hours, or that could be spent invested within Trinity, or if you want to look at it individually as a number of chicken filler rolls more per year. I don't really care. What does matter to me is that I see the Union of Students Ireland as something that does not represent the students in this university, that has absolutely failed to deliver any kind of better deal for students in this country than we would have gotten without them, and that on all counts has been nothing but a talk shop that manages to get nothing done that this college couldn't do by itself. So I want to talk about two things. First of all, I want to look at those failures that I referred to. I want to look at the myriad of them and why it's something that means that this is an organization that we should disaffiliate with. Second of all, I want to look at the alternative, and I want to look at why I think Trinity is absolutely fine as an external actor to the USI, and is in fact better off without it. So first of all, how is USI failing yourself and myself and that 77,000 euro that it gets from Trinity every year? Well, first of all, I'd say by sheer virtue of knowledge, by virtue of the number of people who put their hand up when they said they didn't know whether or not USI was something we should stay in, that's indicative of an organization that isn't doing something to improve your life as a student. The fact that like most people find out about USI just from other students talking about student politics in that student hackery way, not because USI actually does something that influences our lives, shows it, shows to me anyway, that it's something that is isn't actually actively working for every given Trinity student. It rep does it represent our views? I'd say that it represents an awful lot of organisations, far more students than Trinity represents, uh, that come from colleges with entirely different demands to this university, that come from ITs, that come from small universities outside of Dublin. And while there's nothing wrong with going to those universities, it creates such a like, well, it creates such a <laughs> Uh, we'll edit that out of it. Uh, it creates such a multitude of different needs and demands within one organisation that I can de never deliver upon them all. Second of all, I think we need to face the reality that the USI is essentially ransom to a group of people who like to imagine themselves as some kind of Che Guevara, who are prepared to accept nothing other than no fees, no increase, never. Let's be honest, this country is going down the toilet. We cannot be the people to expect that 100% of the time, and every time that union delivers on our behalf the message that we're not prepared to accept, accept every, anything else is any time that a minister, minister can only go, we're just going to have to ignore that. We need, a, uh, we need certainly Trinity students uh, uh, need to, like, and students generally, if you ask me, need to assess the situation with a sense of pragmatism. I'm happy for there to be an institution that is a talking shop for education as a right, but I don't think they need our money. Money. And I don't think that they should be the ones representing us at the negotiations table when people need to be a bit more pragmatic than that. When people need to realise that the public, when they examine the issue of student fees, are also looking in their own pocket and are also asking, why are we taking all the cuts and these guys take none of the hit? Every time that they march down the road and all they're prepared to accept is no rise, never, is an opportunity that we've lost to discuss things that might actually be practical solutions, like some kind of student loan scheme, like reforming the grant system, uh, like those kind of things. Things that might actually help to ensure that there's no one in this country who doesn't get to go to university who otherwise wouldn't. If we stay on the track that these guys keep us on, and if we lose our voice in the dialogue that is Union of Students Ireland, we don't get this opportunity. We've seen nothing but a failure under Mr. Redmond's reign uh, to do anything to halt a rise in fees. I don't think that an increase in 
750 euro over the past few years is anything to be proud about, especially when it's been in, in, in such an inequitable manner, a sort that like actually does just represent an extra fee you pay, as opposed to having sat down and organised some kind of loan scheme and actually maybe guaranteed and safeguard the future of students paying fees in Ireland. In fact, I'd say at times the tactics that the Union of Students of Ireland takes are frankly embarrassing. The fact that they um, organised an impromptu sit-in wherein not pepper spray but the threat of pepper spray was enough to move them from their original site <laughs> shows, shows not only that this is an institution that doesn't take regard to our views and that doesn't ask us before they act but is rather toothless in the way in which they actually engage in those petty tactics anyway. What did we get out of that? Nothing. When did they get a meeting with the Minister for Education when they actually asked as a union? Nothing came out of those sort of tactics and it reflects exactly the kind of ransom to people who love imagining themselves as being part of some kind of anti-state revolution that USI is always going to be held to and that's simply the reality. Right? Is the USI an institution of integrity? One thing that has struck me doing my homework on this topic was the emphasis that keeps getting put uh, on Minister Rory Quinn's election promise not to increase current charges. Whether or not like it was morally correct or whether or not it was possible for him to enact that promise or keep that promise or whether or not he should have, you would certainly hope that that means that the USI is an institution which follows on its promises. So I did a little digging on that. I read Mr. Redmond's manifesto from 2009 which says in bold that he will refocus his attention and attitude towards postgraduate students in this country. If you refer to uh, uh, arrangements as of two months ago, the GSU which represents 40% of Trinity students uh, overall, the Graduate Students Union, wasn't sent so much as a polite phone call call or an email to be told that they were being represented in a government sit-in. Like, they don't fulfill their own promises or keep anything from them. They don't do anything with our money that I don't think Trinity could do itself. We'd say that despite all of its failures, they've made changes to the Constitution, and I know he's going to give you some technical rationalisation as to why that was totally cool for them to do. They have made changes to their Constitution, such that Mr. Redmond gets an extra term as President. They've made changes to their Constitution, so such that they get incremental increases in pay rises which they wouldn't otherwise get. I'm sure he's going to give you some explanation as to why that results in something like 400 euro less being earned a year, but certainly in, in its actual facility, as they are able to do it, it allows them to incrementally up their pay far beyond that. So I want an answer to that. I want him to tell us why he thinks he's earned that extra year, why he thinks any of their sabbatical officers might have earned that extra money, because to me it seems like we haven't gotten anything from the USI in the past past few years, we're all being asked to shell out a whole lot more money and they don't deserve what they're awarding themselves. Do we need the USI? Let's look at what it does well, right? And it does do some things well. It gives a lot of help to small institutions uh, with posters, with class rep training, with things that the Trinity, like the Trinity Institution manages to do fine itself. The third thing that it probably does do well, and Mr. Redmond is going to talk about, is training sabbatical offices. First of all, I'd say that that's a bit of a peripheral issue and it's a much bigger deal that they're not representing us politically. Second of all, I'd say any sabbatical officer in Trinity knows that half of those training weekends are a piss up. If we can just be honest with ourselves for a minute, I think we can say that you can ask your previous sabbatical officer through the institutional knowledge that they have and then maybe spend less than 77 grand on getting it for the rest of them to fill in whatever knowledge gap there exists. I think that most of those peop uh, candidates for sabbatical officers will admit that they probably don't need that specialist training. It doesn't warrant the USI existing as of right now. Are there alternatives? Yeah, I think there are. I think that we, uh, it's not snobbish to say that Trinity has the institutional like history, the institutional prestige, and some of like the greatest minds in the country, and to say that we can have a voice in this country. We can be that fresh voice of reason that sits down at a negotiations table and says, we're not just going to make demands that you can never fulfill and whinge about demands that you didn't fulfil, but can sit down at the table and say, Trinity believes in finding a pragmatic solution, one that can suit students in Ireland, one that can safeguard our educations, but one that takes into account the fact that this country isn't in a position whereby it can guarantee those rights for everyone. At least, and even if it's, that's not our conclusion, it is the voice from the Trinity College Dublin students of Ireland, and not this amalgamated voice that is nothing but held to ransom, as I've explained. 
we think that, like, or I would say that uh, USI um, are, I'm sure, going to tell you that they are the only ones who get seats at HETAC meetings or who get seats with the minister. The Graduate Students' Union, who they ignore, got a seat with the minister to sit down and talk about pragmatic solutions a month or two ago. The only reason they've got that monopoly is because they are a monopoly. We need to be that fresh voice who says that we are prepared to discuss on behalf of Trinity students a solution that we think can work. I think that that's a viable alternative and I think that even if it didn't work I'd be far happier keeping that extra few euro or that 77,000 euro for Trinity and spending it on something productive, something that the USI simply isn't. Thank you. his fine speech and now we invite the podium to the moment. Uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen. Um, firstly I want to start by thanking uh, the Phil and TCDSU uh, for giving me this opportunity to come and address uh, members of USI. Uh, and to be honest it's great to be able to come out on the ground and address the membership and member unions of USI. Every single time I've been asked to take part in something similar to this over my 18 months in office, I've been glad to do so. And yes, it is proper and right that TCDSU considers their membership in USI. It would be naive, and nothing short of naive, if TCDSU and its members decided to continue to be part of an organisation that they didn't understand, or didn't feel was worthwhile or beneficial to them. This evening I hope to be able to put aside some of the myths uh, that Mr Byrne has spoken about, and also some of the other myths that are going around campus at the moment. Uh, but before I do that, I thought I'd give a brief introduction on how exactly USI works. And USI is not me going off and deciding policies and running down the streets like Mr. Byrne has led you to believe. USI is a grassroots, membership-led organisation. To give you an example, USI's policies, such as the fees policy Mr. Byrne talked about, was set at USI Congress. USI Congress will happen in April again this year. And if the students of TCDSU the, uh, and the members of TCDSU want to change that policy, propose a motion at Congress and it will be voted on. Whatever the outcome of the vote will be USI's policy. So it's not up to me to decide what USI's policy on fees or grants or any other issue is, it's up to the membership. The membership of the 40 different colleges around the island. Every year USI has a Congress that's similar to some of the other Congresses that you might be familiar with, like the Teachers' Congress. And what happens is, each student's union is asked to send, member, or asked to send a delegation uh, in proportion to the size and the number of students they represent. So TCDSU would send between 17 or 18, depending on the year. Uh, college like St. Angela's or one of the other smaller institutions that Mr. Byrne talked about would send too. So we can already see that TCDSU has a huge amount of power within USI. At that very Congress, USI elects its officer board, and it also sets policy. That's what a policy set, it's not set by the officer board, and I'm at pains to, to try and emphasize that point. The second uh, rundown in the USI structure is National Council. A, a National Council is equivalent to your Students' Union Council here. Every four to six weeks, the officer board write reports, and each of the full-time sabbatical officers from around the country come to National Council to hold us to account, but not only that, to plan campaigns no single campaign and no single action, including the sit-in that, that, that Mr. Byrne talked about, was not sanctioned by the membership and was voted on, and voted on you know, overwhelmingly by that National Council. The last step down is the officer board, and the officer board is made up of the full-time officers of the union, and they are simply there to implement the campaigns and implement the policies that are decided by the membership. People sitting in this room, through the delegates they sent to Congress, and through their full-time sabbatical officers who turn up at National Council, have their say in how campaigns are run uh, and vote on campaign strategy. And Mr. Byrne is indeed correct. USI recently changed its constitution because USI is 52 years old this year, and an organisation that was fit for purpose 52 years ago is not fit for purpose today. And that's why we had to change it. Ireland is changing, and we need this student movement that was fit to represent students in a modern Ireland. And this constitution didn't come about by myself and the members of the officer board sitting in a dark, smoke-filled room, as you may be led to believe. This came about from the membership. There was representatives uh, from 12 different colleges, 12 different member unions, <coughs> colleges and universities across the country, who came together to write this constitution. It went out for feedback uh, from the membership uh, seven different times, uh, and we took that feedback in and, and incorporated it into the document. And then the document went to a vote at a special congress. And again, TCDSU, like all other member unions, came to that special congress and, and voted uh, whether they wanted 
this document to be passed and be the new constitution of USI or not. So that's just a brief outline of how the structures of USI works, and I wanted to get that uh, across from the start. The, the other thing is, and the last point I'll take on the constitution, is that we've heard, heard an awful lot of myths about pay rises for officers. There will be no pay rises for officers under the new constitution. What the constitution says, and I'm happy to show anyone in a copy, is that USI officer board's wages will be set to a rate of the Irish civil service. And what that means is that in the good times it might move up incrementally, and in the bad times it will come down. At the moment, a USI officer is paid €24,000 per year. Next year that will be pegged to a level on the Irish civil service pay scale. The nearest level is actually €23,100. So, in all likelihood, USI officers will be taking a pay cut of €900 next year. The other thing to bear in mind is that Expenses and officer salaries are set not by the officer board, not by me as president. They're set by an independent, elective, uh, independent, elect, independent elected finance committee that's made up of an independent chairperson, three people from the outside business world currently made up of a solicitor, a company director and an accountant, two members of the membership of National Council elected by National Council and all the external <coughs> members are elected by that National Council as well. So as I said, it's not me sitting in a room deciding what officers are paid, it's an independent group which can be overturned by the membership if they so wish. <coughs> to talk about why TCDSU should be members of USI, and I'm not going to stand here and lie to you, if TCDSU were to disaffiliate from USI, it would be a huge blow, not only to USI, not only to the student movement, but also to your colleagues, the 250,000 other students across the country. Over the past 52 years when TCDSU have been affiliated to USI, Sabbatical officers in TCDSU have stood side by side with USI and members from other colleges to have great achievements. TCDSU led the campaign within USI to ensure that we can all go to the pharmacy today and purchase condoms. That your student union welfare officer can hand out condoms. It was because of USI that contraception is now available readily and over the counter in Ireland. More recently, USI has been working on a number of things, and I'm glad Mr. Byrne described himself as a poor student who, who pays his five euro membership fee and then three euro and other and ancillary fees to cover the cost of attending USI events. But without USI, this evening, there's thousands of students who live in Trinity Halls. Trinity Halls was paid for by a tax break and a tax exemption that was won by USI. The Trinity Access Programme is the best access programme and the most successful access programme in the country. It allows students, the very students that Mr. Byrne talked about, disadvantaged students, to attend university. And yes, absolutely every student who has the ability should be able to attend university. It should not be based on their, on their pay packet or how much their parents can afford. It should be based on academic ability. Because of the extra money in student grants that USI secured, and in particular the thousand euro additional uh, added on to the top up grant, many, many students in the Trinity Access Programme are now able to go on to better themselves and get a university education. Last year, USI fought for and had the Student Support Bill implemented. Many people in this room will be familiar with the fact that 66 different authorities administer grants for students across the country. That means students get their grants late, it's time consuming, it's full of red tape, and it's expensive for the Exchequer. Last year USI managed to get a piece of legislation introduced called the Student Support Act. What that means, from next September, there will be one central grant awarding agency. Students will get paid not only on time, but they'll get paid on a monthly basis directly into their bank account. Because I don't know any student who pays their ESB bill three times a year, or, or tries to put food on the table three times a year. So that would be a major step forward for students. For the most disadvantaged students in society, some of you will be aware of the Student Assistance Fund. The Student Assistance Fund was a pot of money. 5 million euro, 2.5 million funded by the Irish Exchequer and 2.5 million euro funded by the European Social Fund. That money is, is there to help the most disadvantaged students in society stay in college. USI not only had that fund established, managed to keep it throughout uh, and protect it from cuts year after year as we've gone through austerity, but this year we've also been able to add an additional 4 million euro to that to make sure the most disadvantaged students in society can stay in college, stay in university, get a degree, and go out and better themselves and better their families. Other issues USI have been working on is rights for everybody in society, whether that be the disabled, whether that be lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people. Right across the spectrum, over the years, USI has fought for and continues to fight for the rights for and to ensure people are equal in society. Ladies and gentlemen, if TCDSU were to disaffiliate from USI tomorrow, not only would that mean a loss of 70,000 euro or 8 euro per student to USI, 
what it would mean is that USI would have to scale back on operations and obviously couldn't deliver as much for our other members across the country. But why should TCDSU be worried about that, I hear you ask? And Mr. Byrne from the outset makes what appears, certainly on the surface, to be a very rational argument that we could keep the 77,000 euro and invest it in Trinity. But what happens when UCDSU decide to do the same? When ULSU decides to do the same, UCCSU, and every single student union decides to do the same. Instead of having two people in a room shouting, you get a crowded room and nobody is listened to, and the student movement lose out. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll conclude with this. If I'm right, sorry, excuse me, if I'm wrong and the proposer is right, the best case scenario is, for a limited amount of time, TCDSU may have a short period of individual achievements using that money. But if I'm right and the proposer is wrong, the worst case scenario will be that the student movement will be irreparably damaged, and not only that, I personally think that that is a situation and a gamble that I'm not willing to take, I don't think you should be willing to take, and I don't think the students across this country should be willing to take. Thank you very much. speech and remind everyone that at the end of the, the rebuttal period you have a choice to come up here if you so wish for two minutes and then give your point of view. Uh, now we have a period of five minutes rebuttal each, so in direct response, uh, Dave Brown. Okay, so I've got a lot, of, uh, a lot to get through, so I'm going to try and make this fast. I'm just going to list things that Gary said that uh, were wrong. So, um, <laughs> first, first of all, he talks to us about this grassroots membership that I've ignored. Pretty sure I said the grassroots membership was a problem, and that like the problem is that there are so many other institutions that, that our view is so entirely diluted, and that we are held to ransom by a minority in that grassroots who are the loudest voice. Like, like Gary, you say that you really enjoy coming to address Trinity students all the time, the majority of them have no idea who you are. Like, that's the problem, okay? Right, so we think that part of the problem is not enough Trinity students are aware of USI, then part of the problem is that that grassroots issue is one that actually skews policy that could have helped us. I think it's uh, indicative of uh, the failures of USI that there was no mention, despite the fact that I'm pretty sure I talked a lot about it, of that 750 euro increase and as to why that's a massive failure on USI's part. Gary chose not to even reference that once. I think maybe he des like we deserve an answer on how he can reconcile him thinking USI have done such a great job with that hit that we've all taken in this room, right? Second of all, he said that, oh, well, no campaign uh, is not voted on, including the sit-in. Also ignoring the fact that I had just given you an example of a campaign that was not voted on that sit-in uh, in which the GSU were not notified of whatsoever and that was quite like a public uh, uh, um, response by the GSU and so I think that's an example of that problem there. Like uh, when asked about wages and tenure in the constitution we got that technical answer that I anticipated. I ask any of you to go read that constitution and tell me that you get out of it what Gary gave you. At the very least it is worded and written in such a way that like, it allows for a misinterpretation or it allows for that interpretation. At the very least, I think the, the term shady coins how I would term like, the phraseology of that constitution. Certainly not something that I feel confident about. There was a slew at the end of Gary's speech of self-congratulation for all the things that they've done for Ireland, right? Um, oh, getting a tax break during the Celtic Tiger for building purposes. <laughs> This idea of like day one contraception for Ireland, I'm prepared to say that the students' movement had uh, like contributed to that. I just don't think that it's factually in any way close to the case that that was won over by the USI, so I'm not going to deal with that any further. This idea of best and worst case scenario, look, we're not forever out in the dark just because we're not in USI. It's not the only opportunity through which students can get together to decide that they want to campaign for something. Maybe in the future, if USI has a campaign that actually means something, or the Trinity wants to get behind, then we can get behind that campaign as an external actor. We have to decide the best way to use our voice because it is a loud voice in the like, student political sphere. And we can't just say that we're afraid of the consequences if we don't just throw it into the bucket of USI that spews out whatever, like, whatever like, resolution it comes out to, whatever like, left-wing stuff it comes out with at the end of the day after that. Right? So I, don't th I think that this scaremongering that Gary did for you isn't really doing the situation very much justice. 
there's plenty of scope for our sabbatical offices to cooperate, to intermingle with different university sabbatical offices. It doesn't always and every time have to be done with the US side. So just don't buy that. And I think that at the end of this debate, you need to ask yourselves whether you feel it's actually been justified in solid truth that the USI is doing a job for you, and as to whether or not you're confident that Trinity <coughs> students themselves can organize and can make demands that are reasonable, that we come up with in a better and more effective way than what we've seen from USI in the past few years. I think you'll find the answer is that we can. Yes, we can. I move to propose, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I can safely say that's the first time I've been accused of being left-wing anyway. I've been accused of a lot of things, not left-wing. But anyway, to take uh, some of the issues uh, that Mr. Byrne talked about in his rebuttal there. Again, to come back to the point, if you take your €70,000 and invest it in a fund uh, that TCDSU manages, at the moment, you have five full-time static officers working on local issues, like making sure you have better library opening hours. If you use that €70,000 to go off and run your own national campaigns, that means that the time of those five sabbatical officers is divided. They already have enough work to do, and I'm sure any of them will tell you that, but now they have to stretch to even more work. The other situation, and the idea of the sit-in, I'm happy to produce minutes to show you where it was voted on, not once, but twice, by all members of the union. So I'm uh, happy to produce that, that's no problem. €750 Euro increase. Uh, to be honest, yes, that has been an absolute failure. I, I completely agree. And a single cent hurts middle income families. And yes, we do need to have a situation in Ireland where every single person, as I said earlier, who has the academic ability to go on to university can do. TCDSU can play a major part, has played a major part, and continues to play a major part within policy setting in USI. If you don't like our fees policy, change it at Congress. If you don't like our grants policy, change it at Congress. If you don't like the structures of USI, if you don't like the Constitution, change it at Congress. Because we are here to deliver for the members right across the country. To touch on a couple of other things, if TCDSU were to leave USI, and we've heard people say that they could get a meeting with the minister, no problem, that they'd get a seat on the HEA, uh, they'd get a seat in this place, that place, and the other place. The, the fact of the matter is that USI meets the minister on a monthly basis. When the GSU met the minister, it was an informal meeting with his advisors for a couple of minutes. The minister meets USI to formulate policy. USI has a seat on the HEA. The HEA not only decides funding for all the higher education institutions in the country, how the funding is divided up, but it also sets the policies. And by leaving USI, TCDSU would be letting the students of UCD, UCC, NUI Manute, and NUI Galway decide how their funding is divided up. And what's correct and good for NUI Galway probably isn't correct and good enough for TCD. A TCD will have absolutely no input into that decision. There's a new quality assurance agency about to be set up to decide how your degrees are quality assured. Again, it'll be the students of UCC, UCD, NUI Manute, and NUI Galway who'll be deciding those quality assurance processes for TCD. The last point, and I'll finish on this quickly, and Dave's absolutely right. If TCDSU disaffiliates from USI, of course they can come back if they decide to have another referendum. But the fact of the matter is that in the current climate, we need to stick together, and by the time TCDSU realise that perhaps they've made a mistake, it may be too late. Thank you very much. You've heard the speeches, I guess, from two people uh, who are quite informed about the issue and quite vehement. So what we're going to do now is open the floor a la RTE Frontline. Uh, so if anyone here has a, wants to do a two-minute floor speech to talk about issues perhaps that weren't mentioned, to talk about uh, some that were mentioned, uh, you're free to do now. Do we have any volunteers for that? Uh, Peter, and yeah, do you want to just come up here to the front as well? And then Peter, do you want to come as well? And we've got one. If you'd like to speak, just come to the front here, and then Glenn will time two minutes. How many that. Do you think you have more response? Are we going to respond each time? Uh, well, this is, you can, yeah, good point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess it's like, it's up to the candidate if they want to address a uh, speaker. Okay, this could just be for the, the audience. Uh, so it's up to Peter for the start of I might be a bit jittery because I couldn't find a pen or paper to write this down, but I've got, I've, I've got some in my head, so whatever. Um, I'd, I'd just like to talk about the issue of like the democratic legitimacy in USI, which hasn't really been addressed by either of the speakers in this, which is essentially that 
Um, in a few weeks, I get to vote on president. I get to vote on all the sabbatical officers, officers of TCDSU, but I don't get to vote directly for a single officer in USI. Like, we don't vote for them. And we don't vote for our uh, sabbatical officers on the basis of USI candidates. Like, I didn't know who Gary Redman was until, I, until like a few weeks ago. Like, and a lot of Trinity students don't either. Um, uh, so I believe that like, so I think that we, that USI does need some serious democratic reform. And what's a good way to get it? Well, um, at the moment I believe that two other universities in Ireland are not members of USI. If us and maybe another couple of, col couple, couple of colleges disaffiliate from USI, they're going to have a serious problem. They're going to have to consider serious reforms in order to get colleges back into them. Maybe they'll become more democratic. Maybe they'll become a more efficient organization. And honestly, I think that us leaving USI, because I don't disagree in principle with the concept of a national student union. I think it's a great idea. But I think that it really needs reform. And currently, USI is not fit for purpose in any way. So I'd have to ask everyone here to support the motion for that reason. Thank you. Study, but um, it's very different from any national notes I've made before because everyone actually is listening. Um, I just want to acknowledge one or two things. Uh, Gary, um, I suppose we can make this a little bit interactive if, if that's okay with you. Um, I'd just like you to acknowledge the fact that you're actually on the pay drive above the rest of your officers um, it, it, under the new constitution. Um, under that pay rise, I just want to say, and you can read rebuttal to it later on. Uh, did you give any considerations, should, with, that, with or without a Trinity College student union marching with you, to the potential damage in terms of PR, in terms of a pay rise that you may take, um, and what you will say to me today. I'm very happy if you do um, have an answer, and, and to, to your credit if you do. Looking at the board here, um, in terms of education and welfare, um, the, USO, the rest of the USO welfare, it's a pity you don't get to come, out, uh, come up and stand on your role um, and speak on your role, because uh, they're the really strong effector, the very good effector function of USI. Um, of, like, I think we have some two, we have fantastic candidates so far in the race for education and welfare. Actually, I better move on. But I think we're fine. We're fine in terms of training for these. Unfortunately, I would love if you could speak because you do do fantastic work. Um, but in terms of a national message, uh, I think the, I think the demand-based approach, uh, Mr. Byrne. Um, uh, uh, alluded to it, but the um, the rise of by 750 euro. I think we need to look at um, getting back to the negotiating table, not sitting on the floor of the relevant government departments, but sitting at the negotiating table again. Now I know you do meet uh, monthly with Minister Quinn, but I think we might damage our relations by uh, continuing uh, these kind of radical um, these radical things. And lastly, uh, I'm not going to uh, accuse you of scaremongering, but um, if you uh, if you say that our views will be completely disregarded. Uh, by other colleges in terms of quality control. First of all, point them on our rankings. Um, second of all, um, uh, second of all, um, I think if the other colleges uh, begin to disregard us, I think, and or even regard our opinion with regards to USI, uh, we can rebuild USI from the ground up. Now, I'm not saying it's completely defunct, I and mean, a lot of the old kind of um, factors in USI, I suppose, will be maintained. Uh, but I think it, it would be a useful, a useful exercise, maybe. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid all of this is criticism directed at our USI cousin uh, from UCD. But uh, just some cool things about your speech. You kind of started off and you said what, you know, you can't, your, the first half of your speech was kind of largely about the democratic nature of the USI and kind of reciting off repeatedly that it was great because it was democratic and we could change it if we want. Kind of aside from the point that as far as I'm concerned, more importantly, you made good points at the end about what USI has contributed to the different things you've done, the con noms, the grants, all this. And I'm not denying, uh, Dave said, it's arguable how much of an influence you had. But I'm not denying maybe you did have an influence. The problem I see is, was it really necessary for Trinity and all the rest of the colleges across the country to donate 70 grand a year for us in particular anyway? For sabbatical officers we already have, we already have Ryan Bartlett, we already have the other communications officers, why couldn't they just meet up without this 70 grand contribution a year? Like, is that part really necessary for people to meet up when national matters arise? And you're kind of mentioning that it will be a constantly divided voice. This is what I don't get. Like, it could still be a united voice when it needs to be. It doesn't have to be a constantly united voice. We are up to separate colleges. We are separate universities with separate needs, as Dave said. And we don't always need to be on the same side on all matters. And uh, finally, you mentioned that your sabbatical officers doing constant work for like our libraries and stuff. Again, we have sabbatical officers. They're getting funded. That's the point of our ones. We don't need a USI controlling little things with us. We only need to meet up on the big national matters. When it's needed and to get if you can reply to that now, I'm happy with it. you want to seven? Do you might just get through everyone and then okay, I'll get yeah. uh, Sorry, 
right, Gary, once again, I'm going to address this to you. Um, <laughs> I voted against the motion when it was proposed, but I think you don't get the point. Um, you said to us, if you've got a problem, propose a motion at Congress. If you've got a problem with the Constitution, change it at Congress. That's not the issue here. The issue here is that decisions made by USI Congress are not representative of how Trinity students feel, and they're therefore not represented by the institution. I think, uh, I think I mean, this is a short point, but I think this was indicated by, by the fact that you said it's like your SU council. If you think that any, well, most students in this college consider their SU council a representative of how they feel and how they want to vote, then that's just disconnected from the students. I just wanted to uh, extend on from Jack's question that you spoke at length of the merits of the USI decision making process. But surely there's something very wrong with that process if the majority of students were completely against the sit-in protest part of education and the majority of students are implicitly against your fee stance. Do you think there's something else to change within the USI to allow to compensate the fact that your decisions you're making based on what you feel is a majority in the USI aren't supported at the grassroots level by students? Thank you. Thank you. I would like to take the issue of the march that took place uh, late last year. Um, as you know, many of you would have been on it, uh, a pitiful amount of students, between somewhere between 20,000 and 30,000, attended the march last year, depending on where you read about it, to demand that the government would keep their election promises. Now, there's been much reference to this occupation in inverted commas that took place up on Marlborough Street, which was originally supposed to take place up on Moldsworth Street, but uh, we were convinced not to for one reason or the other. And people had left by 10 o'clock the next morning. Now, I don't know what your opinion would be uh, with regard to the glo global occupation movement, but none of them, or very few of them at least, have moved when asked and have given a time in which they would leave. It kind of defeats the whole purpose of occupation, if you ask me. Um, now, there was also, and perhaps the President can clarify the figures for me, I heard 10 grand thrown about, I don't know, that there was an event management staff at this occupation at the cost of uh, 10,000 euros, that's 10,000 of uh, my and your money, and I was just wondering, does he even trust the students themselves to behave uh, in an orderly fashion? Um, last week, as you all know, Antisha and Kenny announced that fees uh, would go up to three thousand euro. In my estimation, that's quite conservative. I imagine that will be more than that in a few years. So. What I would ask is that if you're considering to stay within this union or whether to leave it, what action should that union take or what action TCD SU should take? Are these actions, are they called, are they enough? Or do we need to take more radical steps, be what they may? Or it has to be said that these tactics are not working. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll go back to the USI Special Congress, which I was at um, earlier this year. Um, just two issues I think come out of it. One is to do with the Constitution. I think that, uh, that Gary didn't quite represent it fairly. My understanding, and certainly what was, what was said, what was debated on that day, was that with each extra year an officer stays in the position, they get a pay increase. Now maybe Gary can... Uh, tell us that that's correct, but that's my understanding of what the Constitution says, and some of the misconceptions he was discussing, I think, come out of that, um, which he didn't reference. Uh, the second thing is Angus Omwelon, who I don't think is here today, no. Uh, Angus Omwelon said that the USI was respected across Europe as a, as a lobbying body. Now, I wouldn't go along with a lot of today's arguments about, you know, the individual need to, to, to have just Trinity sticking out of its own. I believe we are stronger together. But I think we've got to recognize that we went from, in the mid-90s, around 150 euro to 3,000 euro in a couple of years' time uh, in, in our fees. Oh, this is a very massive increase over a short period of time. And yet, if we compare what happened with the march this year to what happened with the march last year, we should be very, very worried about whether our tactics are developing. Last year, we had a bigger match uh, with much more students that was prepared uh, long, you know, quite a bit further in advance. If you were to listen to our TCDSU this year, there were, you could hear audible signs 
dissatisfaction that they weren't being told about how this, how, you know, whether this march was being organized and when it was being organized and when it was coming. So it was organized early, it was organized better, more students attended it, and you had this big thing which was the election. So you could say, I am a vote. This year, we had the same tactic, despite the fact that last year didn't work, and we still got the increase. We had the same tactic, with less people, organized over a shorter period of time, and without the election to give us any kind of leverage. The, number, the most important thing that we, for us, for the student movement, I think, uh, and for USI, is to find an ability to create leverage over the government so that we can say, you know, we can exert some degree of power in this time when they're making cuts and increasing fees for things. And I don't think that we made any progression towards finding leverage in the tactic between last year and this year at all. Hi there everyone, uh, I would just like to actually clarify a matter to the room uh, that was brought up about the usefulness of USI training and as, as someone who's received USI training I think I'm in a, a very good position to do that. Um, I can clarify that in addition to the training I received from my predecessor, the training I received at UOS, which is the training session at the start of the year, in communication skills, negotiation skills, campaigning skills, academic policy, lobbying skills, the role of the HEA, the Bologna process, quality assurance, the grant system which was delivered by HEA officials who we could ask questions to, and casework including dealing with minority groups such as mature students, was absolutely invaluable to my role as a sabbatical officer. Top-up training is also provided to the USI, mostly to the welfare officer. I would like to clarify in my view that this cannot be replaced by paying the outgoing sabbat for another week. Now, of course, whether you think that USI should continue delivering this training or whether TCDSU should invest money in providing a similar level of training is up to the students of this college. Uh, I kind of you can see I was the last. I wasn't going to come up, but since you're all kind of like flogging a dead horse, I figured I'd just throw my bit in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm a first year, I'm a class rep, I'm also a member of the Philosophical Society, so I'm sort of like jumbled into this debate. Um, just a couple of things that uh, Mr. Redmond said. Uh, if Trinity SU in the past did lead the charge and all these big things like condoms, surely we would have done that anyway, and surely USI were simply slowing us down in that thing. Um, if Trinity SU were to disaffiliate from USI, would USI turn their backs on us straight away? I find that a little bit disgusting that as soon as we stop paying an organisation, they're going to completely disregard us. I think that's just either not the case or just a bad thing, so something to leave and make me even more want to leave an organisation like that. And just the thing that we got that we won't be able to talk with our ministers. I'd rather have a room with like more people with a single viewpoint than having two representatives with this jumbled collection of viewpoints that are kind of interspersed and contrasting and just aren't going to get anything done. If we have more people shouting, then we allocate more time to those people, not have two people to say different things. And yeah, I'm just probably going to say what I said. So thanks. Cheers. <laughs> All the, those who gave us floor speech uh, uh, via our speakers, particularly probably Gary, uh, to have a few responses, and then we'll open to questions from the floor. I'll try and get through pretty much everything that everyone said there. Um, I'll take theory of, of the pay rises first. And, and, and again, the constitution is there and I'm happy to show anyone the relevant paragraph. What it says is that you will be matched to a level on the Irish Civil Service, which is about 900 euro less than what they get paid now. Show but, the paragraph. You keep saying you're going to show it to us. I'll, I'll show it to the end, but you're not going to be able to see it if I hold the constitution up for a room. Tell us your interpretation. We need to hear it. It also says that if you hold, are re-elected by Congress to the same position, you may move up one increment. Now, the word I stress there is may, you may not, is, is, is the opposite of that. If you did move up one increment, it would be equivalent to about 20 euro per week. Now again, if the membership are unhappy with that, that can be taken back out of Congress. A simple motion from TCSU will be voted on, and that paragraph will come out. Again, it wasn't me that wrote this constitution, it was the membership who wrote it and voted on it. I think someone, perhaps I didn't explain very well, or perhaps my views were misrepresented when I said, when People thought I said that USI works on library opening hours here in TCDSU or here in TCD. We, we don't. The point I was trying to make is that 
if you're finding sabbatical officers who are already overworked, had to work on national issues as well, they would have less time to spend on things like that. Right now, I, I would hazard a guess that about 80% of USI policy is the exact same as TCDSU policy. And the question that people need to ask themselves is, is it worthwhile going on a solo run to try and implement that other 20% without perhaps losing the 80% that you're already getting because the policies are aligned? That's a question people need to ask. And of course, every single student in the current climate must think, is this money that I'm paying? Is this five euro membership fee value for money? People said they'd no way of directly electing the USI president. If the member unions wanted to, I think it would be a fantastic um, progressive move forward where we would have a campus-wide ballot right across the country from all the USI members to elect the USI president. It was trialed in any way Galway a number of years ago quite successfully. And if TCDSU want to have a campus-wide ballot to decide where their 18, their substantial 18 votes go at Congress, they're more than free and more than willing to do so. At the moment, the way it works is that all the candidates for each of the positions are brought into TCSU's council, there's a hostings, questions and answers, and then the council take a vote on where their votes will go. If the Why council... The I'll take points of yeah. Why is it nationwide? That's up to each individual member union. USI is a confederation of student unions. USI doesn't set the policy top down, it's bottom up. Each individual member union is free to run their affairs with USI how they see fit. So if TCDSU wants to do that, that's up to TCDSU. And that there's absolutely nothing stopping them. And in fact, I'd encourage it if it's something that they're interested in doing. Um, just some of the other issues, the, the 10,000 euro figure that was banded about for an event management company. There was no event management company paid for, for the protest uh, in November 16th. We sought the advice, which was provided for free, from some of the event managers from Oxygen, who were there to ensure that the students were safe at all times and everything was provided. Things like fire extinguishers were in place, things like first aid posts were, posts were in place, because the primary concern is the safety of our members. Not a single cent was spent on that. The other thing is, when it comes to money in USI, USI's accounts are prepared by external accountants every single year and presented to Congress. They're accepted or rejected. The accounts are there in black and white if anyone's interested in seeing how exactly your membership fee is spent. The new constitution will make USI membership more accountable, more transparent, but more importantly, it will be more, more open and individual members will be able to feed in. Uh, I have to take questions. Thanks. So if any one of the audience has a direct question to either Gary or Dave, uh, I think just like raise your hand and I think it's fair to take it. Uh, yeah. Sitting down. So uh, James. Um, yeah, I would just like to ask a question to Dave. Just because um, we've heard a lot of criticism tonight of Gary and of USI, and I think that's legitimate because nothing's perfect and there is a lot wrong with USI. But I also think that it's so much easier to criticise something than to construct something. So I'd just like to ask Dave, if you were to envision a national movement for students in Ireland, what would it be that USI is not? Uh, yeah, okay, fair point. I think, first of all, like, it is easier to criticise something than construct it, but it's super easy to criticise USI. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would say, look, there's no reason that we can't have a unified voice for students of Ireland that is not a massive bureaucracy that also awards itself loads of other jobs and like little things to do and puts itself on all sorts of other campaigns that no one ever hears about. I don't think that there's any reason why all the sabbats in Trinity can't have a chat to the students in Trinity and have a meeting with other university sabbats without having to cost us that bomb load and without awarding themselves sole ownership of the right to be able to discuss at a national level, which is something that they do right now. Like what you're saying is um, all the paths around the country taking initiative to do this year to year. Without yeah, that's not that's nothing like USI. What, what, USI is a like behemoth of bureaucracy that is so like that has its own massive council uh, uh, of reps that aren't just sabbatical offices that awards itself loads of other jobs and does way more than just have people meet and discuss what they're going to talk about on a national level. So my point was, let's do it without spending all the money and employing all the other people, and let's not mean that once we do it, we remove the option for ourselves, for example, the Trinity Students Union to approach at a national level and discuss at that level, which we do right now. We delegate it to USI, and I don't think USI do a good job with our voice. I, I think what, what Dave has described there is a situation where we would have each of the individual students union officers from the student unions around the country would meet up perhaps every four to six weeks. So the education officers might sit in the room and decide on what they're going to work on for the next four weeks. They might delegate one of those people to work on that and report back. 
and then perhaps once a year they'll sit around and make policy. Sounds a bit like USI, to be honest. Um, uh, so one legitimate thing that is good about uh, the, the USI is the sabbatical training. But hold on a second, DCU and UL both disaffiliated, and last time I checked, their SU wasn't falling apart. Uh, actually, the last time I did check which SU was falling apart is your previous UCD SU. <laughs> Um, to be honest, um, I'm the USI president now. Um, yes, I was president of UCDSU a number of years ago, and I think that the facts of the matter in UCDSU will be developed upon by their, their own president there. And, and yes, UCDSU has a huge financial problem with its commercial outlets. Uh, but UCDSU uh, and the, the university in UCD employed a senior administrator, a senior accountant to run the union's affairs. Students were elected at the end of the day to run the political wing of the union. Nor should you have your students there doing accounts every single day. The fact of the matter is that a succession of presidents in UCDSU were lied to, and I think it's only appropriate that the president of UCDSU deals with that himself, and I'm sure he will. And what about my previous point that UL and DCU haven't fallen apart because they're not part of USI? Uh, do you, obviously, each in the union is independent to do and look after its affairs how it wishes. USI members not only get the training of USI, they're also able to get the training from NUS UK, which is the National Union of Students in the UK. Any of their training events are exclusively open to USI members as well. To be honest, if you want to know how good USI training is, I suggest you ask one of your sabbatical officers for their feedback, because I think their feedback will be an awful lot more relevant than mine on that. Okay, there's far more questions than we have time, so just make it direct. There's just one question per person and the response as direct as possible. So, Anna? Uh, yeah, Mr. Redmond, uh, you described in your speech student policy often as being a whole bunch of people in a room shouting at each other. Uh, the bureaucratic structure of USI is multi-layered and it's incredibly cumbersome. And with a low take-up rate in student politics anyway, people will inevitably fall through the cracks. So when was the last time you mandated a policy by polling every student in Ireland? Specifically, when was that last done and why isn't it done more often? Well, the first thing is what I didn't say was USI policy, people in a room shouting. What I said was, if we had a collection of different unions in a room shouting, it would be a crowded room where nothing would be heard. USI policy is formulated by Congress. The policies are written by the student union. It is debated openly, fairly, and then it's voted on by the membership. I honestly couldn't tell you the last time there was a campus-wide ballot. If the membership want to have a campus-wide ballot, that option is open and available to them. It's not up to USI from a top-down to force structures down. This is a bottom-up, grassroots-led organisation. Okay, yep, yep. Um, Gary, yes or no question. If uh, Trinity were to disaffiliate from the USI, if that happened, if that, if that uh, motion went through, and you were president next year, would you shut Trinity out of the decision making process entirely, or would you work with Trinity Students Union on your side? Like, would, you, would you shut us out, or would you be welcome to work with us? Well, the first thing I'll say is that there was a motion put to USI Congress uh, a number of years ago, and uh, which TCDSU voted in favour was that USI would not work with any non-affiliate. It was proposed by TCDSU and voted in favour on by TCDSU. So that would be your own decision being implemented. And of course we'd have to abide by our rules because we have other members who are paying, we have other members who are paying fees and our first priority would be to work for them. Now of course when we achieve some things, TCD students would get benefits for that. But unfortunately, because of the motion put forward by TCDSU, voted in favour of by TCDSU, you wouldn't be able to go to sabbatical training and you wouldn't be able to go to events like pink training, which many, many students across the country and indeed in TCDSU find very, very beneficial. Okay, this side. Uh, my question is about uh, the communications regarding the new constitution. Mm -hmm. There's nothing on the Facebook, there's nothing on the Twitter, there's nothing on the USI.ie either about the Special Congress just before it, are the actual documents. It's all very well having it in front of us now, but there's no way. You can get it through Dunleary IADT, you can find it that way, but that's the only way to get the Constitution. I suppose one of the major failings USI has is that it relies on member unions to be able to communicate directly with members, and that doesn't always work. But as I said, seven times the Constitution went out for feedback. Draft versions, an open call for feedback. There was a special Congress held last June where people could give feedback, and then the final special Congress. Um, so th that, that's how the communication flow works, and it is something we need to, we need to address, I appreciate that. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dave, um, if we did disaffiliate from USI, surely Trinity would lose all bargaining power at a national level? No, I don't think so. Like I said earlier, that I think the only reason the monopoly on bargaining power exists is because, like, is because USI has that monopoly. So we need to leave. Probably should talk to UL and DCU. <coughs> Probably should change that thing where USI should have said entirely, like, we have the option to do. Well, more than anything, I pointed out there that 
whatever bargaining power they do have, like they flush it down the toilet in the way they act. And like, there's no point in just saying that, oh well, bargaining power means we have to be in the US side if all of their negotiations and all of their attempts to engage with government have been absolutely fruitless. As far as I can see, like, <coughs> just really quickly, because I appreciate loads of people want to ask questions. It was the Minister for Education and successive governments that decided USI was the representative group on the Higher Education Authority, on ETAC, on FETAC, on DQAI, on the IUQB. Government will only want to come and discuss things with one particular group, and they want to get the feedback from students and student representatives from one particular group. And unfortunately, if TCDSU decided to disaffiliate from USI, they would be shut out of that process because your friends over at UCDSU will absolutely be deciding what will be pushed forward at the HEA, and perhaps that's a new veterinary hospital for UCDSU instead of a new facility here in Trinity. Because as we all understand, funds are short, there's not as much money to go around as there was previously, and without being a member of USI, TCD students lose the ability to influence at the HEA, most importantly, but also at a number of other state agencies and state boards. I think that's pretty insulting threat. Like, no, it's not a threat, that's, that's, that's a fact. Just like, as a kind of, oh, you'll be shut out. Like, we're no, Intelligent university. No, with a lot of I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it should be a national discussion without like going to like lobbying because that's been so helpful. No, no, this this isn't lobbying. This is having a vote. One of eight people who decide how money is given to universities around the country. How higher education policy is set. The HEA last week made uh, recommendations to the minister on what a technological university should look like, and that is incredibly important. Not only for the seven traditional universities, but also the IOTs of how that plays out going forward. Will that mean TCD and all the other six universities get less funding? Will perhaps be more funding put into the system? <coughs> the only way that the representative of the learner on the HEA can ascertain feedback is through USI, because that's where they're elected from and that's where they're appointed from. It, it wasn't a failed threat, that's just simply how it would operate based on your own motion. Okay, just uh, yeah, I just think that like that is a basis threat. The minister is not like bound by the rules of USI only to talk to USI. And at the point at which we present to him a voice that is more reasonable, we're grouped together with the GSUs that this institution ignores, or UL, uh, or DCU, and, and present him with something, of course he's going to want to meet with like, any student in any form. What's Why hasn't that happened with UL and DCU then? UL, well, UL and Trinity GSUs had to organise their own meeting with the Minister of Minister Advisor. Advisor. Your organization. Minister of Advisor. That's, no, that's not true. They got a meeting with the Minister. Minister of Advisor. Okay, well, we're going to have a meeting. Sure. <laughs> I, I think there was a question from uh, over here on my right uh, from one gentleman about communication, mm -hmm. uh, and you gloss over it and you said that's a problem we've had for a while. Um, but that's, I think that's the reason why we feel why we're all here at the moment, and that problem has been here um, that's, that has existed within the USI for quite a number of reasons, and that is in fact the biggest reason why people are talking about disaffiliation at the moment. And you've seen that problem for the last couple of years, and you have done nothing about it. Now. Uh, last year, in one of the, ca uh, one of the campaigns for UCD at SU, uh, the presidential candidate um, was talking, uh, he, he rebutted a claim that all fees from UCD to uh, USI, um, that the, the 120,000 euro which we pay doesn't in fact come from UCD, SU, it comes from uh, another, another, uh, uh, another element within UCD. This year, he's not too sure about that. So even himself, isn't it, he, he, the UCD SU president, doesn't know where funding comes from uh, or uh, where it comes from for, for USI. So that's a clear problem with communication. I think that, that stems across all of USI and USI's uh, interaction with all of, all of its colleges. I think that is the big problem, and I'd like you to tell, tell us what you're going to do about that. Well, I think the first thing is that where UCSU gets funding for is a matter for UCDSU and not for USI. And um, the second thing, and, and that's not a flippant remark, UCDSU could perhaps be getting that from uh, the students, what was formerly the student services charge. Perhaps, and I think it is the case, that there's an agreement in place with the university when UCDSU reaffiliated, that additional funding was put aside. Uh, again, I can't speak for the present UCSU, so that's, that's perhaps a hypothesis. I actually asked the SU president this week that very question, mm -hmm. and he told me that obviously there's been funding that was supposed to Although it might have been the situation last year, he believes that if UCDSU were to disaffiliate from USI, that the funding wouldn't be taken off them because of the current financial situation they find themselves. Obviously, that's the situation for UCDSU. Different colleges have a levy. There's a levy, for example, here in Trinity where students pay additional money. So it would be questionable whether that would be allowed to stay. Again, I can't answer that question. But, and I will get to your point on communications, Brendan. Um, 
it is a problem. I am absolutely open to hear how we solve it because at the end of the day it is an organisation with 15,000 members and it, we, we've set up a group now to look at how we do it better and it is something we need to improve and something that has to improve rapidly and I completely hold my hands up on that. Okay, but the, the problem seems to be that there's USI here, there's students here, there's students union, yeah. unions here and you claim to be, to for, for USI to be representing the whole, the kind of triumvirate. But then you just come and said that it's actually it actually cuts out here. So how can you claim that you you represent the bottom tier uh, when the middle tier isn't working at all? Well, USI is a confederation of student unions. It's in the opening paragraph of the constitution and has been since our foundation. So it's up to the individual student unions how to communicate with their members. But it is something that we can be better at. Okay, yeah, Ryan. Yeah, I just think just uh, the first thing you were talking about about the motion about should not other colleges. I just to like refresh as to where that came from, because I thought that was part of the ticket originally uh, when you were the president, Connor Trump, the deputy president. And then on the point of being shot of the HEA, I was wondering how you think that's different from the current situation where we don't uh, talk about what's discussed at the HEA. Well, the first thing, I suppose the first thing is that um, I have absolutely no control over what motions TCDSU uh, put to USI. That's up to your own council or depending on what the structures are here. I also have no control over how you vote in Congress, and I certainly didn't, as you as you, President, have any control over your motions and how you voted in the Congress. Um, the, the other thing is that, at the HEA, I'm still bound by USI policy, and, and, and that's, that's the long and the short of it. Where it is possible, I will openly discuss what's happening at the HEA. To be honest, there's a leak in there, and you can read it in the Irish Times most Tuesdays. So at any point, and, and a number of student union presidents came to me recently and said, we're not happy with how we think these technological university guidelines are going. Can you reassure us? What's the situation? And, and where that's happened, I've tried to address it to the best of my ability. Thank you. Uh, yes. um, we've heard from you, Barry, that a benefit of the remaining part of USI is the idea of a united front. Mm -hmm. And you also keep telling us that if we don't agree with the USI policy proposal, we should go to Congress to vote against it. Okay, a scenario where all the Trinity delegates vote no at Congress, but the majority of, Congress, uh, of uh, people at Congress vote yes. My question is, why should we remain part of that United Front when the people of Trinity at Congress did not mandate that United Front? Well, the first thing is, obviously, and obviously that could well happen, it may or may not happen. I'd imagine that if TCD issue were putting forward policy, there would be some other feelings of support towards depending on the policy in other member unions. The situation is that you're not bound by any USI policy. TCDSU is still free to take any stance it wants on any issue. If TCDSU decides tomorrow that it is pro, a graduate tax or pro student loan, TCDSU is more than entitled to come out and say that. USI's policy will still be what was decided by Congress. Each individual member union can come out with its own policies because we're a confederation, uh, not a federation, I suppose is the easiest way of putting it. Okay, before we money, I can add it then. <laughs> <laughs> well, last few questions, uh, the guy at the back of the yeah, quick question today. How do you deal with the idea of the fact that we now have our student officers have to deal with both a national and a local Trinity sort of idea? How do you sort of not enforce imprint pinch on the whole of extra work? How do we do more work? Like, I, like, I don't think that that is asking too much of them. I think, in fact, like, you give some teeth back to our SU president when they can represent Trinity College Dublin students' views and not just delegate them to an institution that will just basically ignore them because they're not in agreement. Yeah, people have spoken before. Uh, there's a real factor. Yeah. Um, hi, it's for Gary. Just yeah. in terms of training, yeah. um, you made it clear that if we just return, decide to disaffiliate, the opportunity to go to some value training in both sabbatical and um, ping training, that we would not have the opportunity. If that's the case, and you speak of how much and valuable both our money and our student view is, if we had the opportunity to go by paying our way, our own way, why would that not be the case? Well, initially, before that motion that I discussed previously, non-members used to be allowed to go to training events, uh, but they paid twice what a member did uh, in recognition that USI member colleges were obviously paying less and USI was getting goodwill off trainers. Um, that was changed by Congress, and again, by that same motion. If a motion was to put to Congress to allow someone to attend, that'll go to Congress in the same manner, but the membership decided that that wasn't USI officer board. Okay, let's get a final call. <coughs> Oh, um, are you going to run for a third term? I'm glad someone asked me that. Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> and well, nominations for USI officer board positions are open at the moment. If anyone's even considering running, talk to the Spadic officers here, talk to me. And they close the end of the month. If anyone's even thinking about it, I'm happy to be talking through the job. Or any of the current Spadic officers in USI will be happy to talk through it and encourage anyone who's even thinking about it to give it some consideration. <laughs> Uh, well, we've heard the speeches from our speakers, from the floor, the questions and responses. Uh, so we're going to take a final vote.
uh, on whether TCD Student Union should leave <coughs> Union of Students Ireland. Uh, all those who think we should leave, please raise their hand. You guys can keep it secret, so it'll be suspense. <laughs> Stay in USI, please raise your hand. Okay, uh, and then those who still are uncertain as to whether what we should do. Okay, significantly less at least. <laughs> Okay, Brendan, Marcus, Brines, and Mats will add up those, uh, and we'll work out how the evening went. I guess I'll take this opportunity, unless we're we're ready to go. Okay, done it up. Okay, uh, to thank uh, the student union, uh, Ronald Costello particularly uh, for uh, for running this, and particularly our speakers Gary and Dave uh, for outlining uh, what the issues are. So I think a round of applause. Great to see so many people that came to this event. Uh, I think it is indicative of, of like the student politics uh, remaining strong, and I hope that the Phil and the Student Union can indeed work in the future to do such uh, forums. Um, there's no reception, I'm afraid. There was no booking, uh, no location available. Remember, I have to know that the Hist reception. <laughs> Free to go. <laughs> yeah. Are we ready? Okay. How exciting. So fun. Okay. Um, so the votes before whether we should stay, or sorry, sorry, we should leave the student uh, USI was 41. It's now 59. That's an 18% increase. Uh, against was 14 before, 32 after. So that's an 18% increase again. So the speakers are, are on par there. And don't know. We went from 46 to nine, which is a negative 30 something percent, 30, 36%. So at least the, the, the sum total of knowledge has increased and people have gone further extremes. Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming, uh, that concludes.